What is biopsychology? Biopsychology is the study at the intersection of neurology and psychology. It's where we can learn how anatomy and physiology can impact actions and behaviors. In this video, we'll be going over the neurology half. We'll see how the nervous system communicates with the rest of the body and how those transmissions can be impacted and altered. So, without further ado, The most basic and arguably most important cell in the brain is the neuron. Its job is to act as the highway of the brain, transmitting messages throughout the metaphorical city in your head. So, how does it transmit information, you ask? All in due time, young Padawan. First, you must learn its structures, starting here. These are called the dendrites. Much like its word entomology would lead you to believe, they do, in fact, serve to transport important stuff. Just not water or nutrients. Instead, they're the ones who receive and relay signals from a preceding neuron. As we follow the electric impulse down the neuron, we reach our next destination, the soma. Also known as the body, the soma doesn't actually play a role in signal transmission. It works to maintain a homeostasis within the cell and keeps it functional with all the organelles and stuff. However, that's boring and drawing is a lot of work, so moving on. Next, we reach the axon, where the action potential actually takes place. This is the really long bit of the neuron. The longest axon in your body belongs to the sciatic nerve. This long boy goes from the base of your spine all the way to the distal end of your tibia. You heard that correctly, that's in fact one cell. By now, I hope that you've noticed these weird looking lumps along the axon. These are called the myelin sheath. Myelin is a lipid based molecule that insulates the axon. It's like a copper wire. Having bare wires are ineffective and also a fire hazard. And while luckily the axon will never set a fire inside of your head, the problem of inefficiency still stands. In fact, the destruction of the myelin sheath is the cause of multiple sclerosis. Finally, we've reached the last part of the neuron, the axon terminal. This is where the signal transfers over from one neuron to another, jumping a gap known as the synapse. The axon terminal is also where neurotransmitters are secreted and reabsorbed. They are released into the synapse to help relay a signal to the dendrites of the next neuron, and the cycle begins anew. Action Potential How do you communicate? Cell phones? Social media? Just talking? Well, neurons don't have those things, so they communicate through electrical events called action potentials along with chemical neurotransmitters. The generation of action potentials can be either promoted or inhibited by excitatory or inhibitory inputs, which come from the axons of other neurons. But first we need to understand membrane potential. Neurons have negative membrane potential, which means that because there is a larger concentration of ions outside the cell than in it, the inside of the cell has a more negative charge than the surrounding fluid. To be exact, the normal membrane potential or resting potential of a cell is negative 70 millivolts. Excitatory and inhibitory inputs can change that membrane potential, making it more positive or more negative. Okay, so where do action potentials come in? They result when the sum of the excitatory and inhibitory inputs makes the neuron's membrane potential reach around negative 50 to negative 55 millivolts. And this is called the action potential threshold. And only when a neuron reaches this threshold will it fire a full action potential. And this is called an all or none response. Oh yeah, neurons are all about that all or nothing lifestyle. Okay, so now we've reached the threshold. What happens now? Well, it all depends on sodium ions outside the cell, potassium ions inside the cell, and this thing called the sodium-potassium pump. Embedded throughout the cell membrane are voltage-gated ion channels, which are channel proteins that open and close based on the voltage inside the cell. When a stimulus causes a voltage-gated sodium channel to open, sodium ions rush from the outside of the cell to the inside in a process called depolarization. Due to the influx of sodium ions, the membrane potential soars up to plus 30 millivolts. And because the voltage now exceeds the stimulus that keeps the sodium channels open, the sodium channels close and sodium stops rushing in. But the same stimulus causes nearby potassium channels to open, causing potassium ions to rush out of the cell in a process called repolarization. Finally, during a refractory period, the sodium-potassium pump binds three intracellular sodium ions and with energy gained from hydrolyzing one ATP molecule undergoes a conformational change, or change in shape, that exposes the sodium ions to the outside of the cell. The sodium leaves and two extracellular potassium ions take their place. And once the pump returns to its unphosphorylated form, it releases the potassium ions into the cell. The cycle continues until the membrane returns to resting potential. 
So in essence, an action potential is a series of depolarization and repolarization stages. Action potentials are also called spikes for heh, obvious reasons. Okay, so now we know what an action potential is, what does it do? An action potential triggers the release of neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft, which is a 20 to 40 nanometer gap between the presynaptic axon terminal and the postsynaptic dendrite. After it's fired across the cleft, a neurotransmitter binds to a receptor on the postsynaptic side, and the receptor it binds to depends on which kind of neurotransmitter it is. Once the transmitter binds to a receptor, it triggers a signal transduction pathway that causes particular positive and negative ions to flow in or out of the postsynaptic neuron. So it's basically throughout this entire event that electrical signals, which are the ions in the sodium potassium pump, are converted into chemical signals, the neurotransmitters, and then back into electrical signals, the ions flowing through the postsynaptic membrane. During reuptake, neurotransmitters are pumped back into the axon terminal that it was fired from in order to clear the synapse. This serves to act as a clear on and off between signals and to regulate the production of neurotransmitters. Now that's what we call recycling. There's a whole load of neurotransmitters that work within your brain, each serving their own specialized purpose. The first one is acetylcholine, often shortened to ACH. It takes part in muscle contraction, alertness, focus, and memory. It's also responsible for regulating the release of other neurotransmitters such as dopamine or norepinephrine. Too much or too little can lead to muscle weakness, increased risk of Alzheimer's, and in severe cases, paralysis. Dopamine is known as the pleasure hormone. It's also part of learning, motivation, mood, attention, and movement. Too much dopamine can be the cause of schizophrenia, and a shortage can, has been linked to ADHD. Dopamine also plays a role in addiction, as some drugs such as cocaine can act as a substitute and give a sense of pleasure. We'll talk about this later. Serotonin is probably best known as a mood regulator, contributing to happiness and other positive feelings. It also helps regulate smooth or involuntary muscle contractions and sleep. Low serotonin has been linked to depression. It can also be the cause of irregular sleep patterns and poor memory. You may know norepinephrine by its function as a hormone, but in its neurotransmitter role, it's essential to the fight or flight response. It makes skeletal muscles contract harder and your heart beat faster. Having too much or too little can lead to higher low blood pressure. GABA is an inhibitor, meaning that it blocks signals instead of transmitting them. A deficiency can lead to anxiety or muscle tremors or even seizures. GABA can be used as a pain reliever. Glutamate, in contrast, is an exciter. It's often involved with forming memories. Too much can lead to headaches or seizures. Endorphins are a subgroup of neurotransmitters. They're short for endogenous morphine and are much like opioids as they control the perception of pain and pleasure. SSRIs SSRIs are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and are the most commonly prescribed type of antidepressant and can also be used to treat anxiety. They treat depression by increasing the levels of serotonin in the brain, again, serotonin being a mood-regulating neurotransmitter. SSRIs work by blocking the reuptake of serotonin back into neurons, making more serotonin available to act as messengers between neurons. SSRIs are selective because they only target serotonin and leave other neurotransmitters alone. Whenever we discover new information, it seems like our first instinct is always, how can I ruin someone's life with this? Nerve gas was invented when a scientist in Germany accidentally gassed himself with a super powerful insecticide he was working on and discovered its potency and deadly side effects. During World War II, the Nazi party took the discovery and made it exponentially worse because they're Nazis and they tend to have that presence. Most nerve agents work by blocking acetylcholine terase, an enzyme that's essential for breaking down ACH. This causes a surplus of ACH, which leads to erratic muscle contractions because as previously mentioned, acetylcholine is in charge of alertness and muscle movement. This can cause things like the constriction of pupils, seizures, and even death via cardiac or respiratory arrest. Black Widow Spider Bite While we all know Black Widow's lovely electrical bracelets, the actual Black Widow Spider Bite is much more deadly. Black Widow Venom contains a presynaptic neurotoxin called alpha-electrotoxin, which affects the CNS by depolarizing neurons and increasing the concentration of calcium ions, which are responsible for triggering neurotransmitter exocytosis. 
thereby resulting in the uncontrolled release of neurotransmitters from nerve terminals. This can mess up the signals going through your brain and can result in stiffening muscles, severe pain, paralysis, and even death. So watch out! Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease of the central nervous system. The immune system attacks and breaks down the myelin sheath. Going back to the copper wire analogy, this leads to the signal skipping and behaving weirdly, as sometimes happens with the bare wire. Depending on where the affected neurons are, there can be different symptoms. This includes numbness or weakness on one side of your body, lack of coordination or unsteady gait, vision loss or blurring, slurred speech, and tingling or pain in parts of your body. Multiple sclerosis comes in waves. The individual might feel like they're getting better, and then after a few days or weeks, worsen again, sometimes with a new set of symptoms. Unfortunately, we don't know what causes MS. There are several risk factors, however, such as old age, being female, being white, or having a history of smoking or drugs. We also don't know how to cure MS, though the symptoms one experiences can be lessened by hormone treatment and other medication and therapy. How do you move your big toe? We can move our fingers independently because each finger has a separate area within a region of our brain called the primary sensory motor cortex that is responsible for controlling them. However, toes are different. There are no individual toes to your brain, index toe, middle toe, propaganda. The brain only knows toes and any signal that's sent out to one goes out to all of them. The big toe is special because it has some autonomy. It is independently represented in the sensory motor cortex, so it can receive special signals from the brain that the other toes don't get. This is why you can do the toe equivalent of a thumbs up, but not flipping the bird. This autonomy of the big toe found in humans is best explained by an association of the big toe with bipedal locomotion, which would have been very useful to our ancestors who are just learning to walk on two legs. Sleep deprivation is a familiar friend of many people in their adolescence. Our lives are filled with busy work that we have to do to memorize arbitrary things to gain the approval of greater society. However, I'm not here today to talk about the many, many failures of our school system, so I'll digress. When you're sleep deprived, you can experience many negative side effects such as loss of appetite, paranoia, or even hallucinations in serious cases. In fact, sleep deprivation might have a direct impact on the neuron itself. When comparing groups of people who stayed up for a night versus people who got a full night's sleep, Researchers found that the neurons in the people who were sleep deprived actually fired slower, had dragged out transmissions, and that the impulse itself was weaker on average. This can also lead to memory loss and lapses in judgment in reaction time. The fact that sleep deprivation literally causes physiological side effects does bring up questions about the morality of subjecting teenagers to it on a regular basis, but you know, I'm not salty. Not at all. No salt here. Cocaine? Question mark? It's flour! It's powdered donuts! No, it's cocaine! In case you don't know what cocaine is, it's a stimulant drug that causes euphoria and increases in energy. Cocaine works by stimulating the buildup of a whole lot of dopamine in the synaptic cleft. Hey, isn't that good? Isn't like that the happiness chemical? Well, yeah, it's true that dopamine is the pleasure hormone and it causes people to feel happy and relaxed, but too much dopamine can cause euphoria and impaired decision making, which often results in bad life choices. So when the body encounters too much dopamine, it tries to restore balance by releasing GABA, another neurotransmitter that inhibits dopamine. So when cocaine induces the release of a heck ton of dopamine, the brain gears up by sending out GABA to restore balance. However, when cocaine is in the system, GABA doesn't work. That's because cocaine's second function is blocking the release of GABA, which prevents the reabsorption of dopamine. Now your synapses are left with too much dopamine and no way to counter it. That's the short-term effect of cocaine. It happens in all parts of the brain that releases dopamine, but the limbic system, which is involved in emotions and memories, is the most impacted. This helps to explain why cocaine is so addictive, because users associate cocaine using memories with euphoria and crave to feel that pleasure again. Long-term use of cocaine can damage dopamine receptors, which impairs the brain's ability to sense dopamine even if large quantities of it are present. This can spread even beyond cocaine use. Simple pleasures like reading a good book or listening to your favorite song can leave you feeling empty and unfulfilled. An individual eventually loses the ability to feel pleasure and reward from anything in life. So don't do cocaine, kids! <laughs>